Today's video is brought to you by artist Jerry Vanderstelt. Jerry has some of the greatest and most recognizable Middle Earth prints to be found. Stick around after the video to find out how you can save 20% off your order at VanderstaltStudio.com. He is the most famous of hobbits, the ring bearer, who would be thrust into a major role in a tale thousands of years in the making. He would undertake the quest of the ring and return home to lead the halflings in retaking the Shire. Today on Nerd of the Rings, we cover the life and travels of Frodo Baggins. Frodo Baggins is born on September 22nd, 2968 of the Third Age. His parents are Drogo Baggins and Primula Brandybuck. When Frodo is just 12 years old, his parents are making a visit to Buckland when they both drown while boating in the Brandywine River. After their deaths, Frodo is sent to live in Brandy Hall, the great ancestral home of the Brandybucks. For the next nine years, Frodo is raised by Primula's brother, Roramac Brandybuck. During this time, Roramac would have a grandson, Mariadoc, who would become great friends with his cousin Frodo. In his youth, Frodo would display an adventurous spirit. Several times, he would be caught stealing mushrooms from Farmer Maggot's farm. During the last of these instances, the farmer thrashed Frodo and had his three dogs chase the young hobbit all the way to Buckleberry Ferry. We later find that it was not only the Brandybuck family who would visit Frodo in Brandy Hall. We are told that one of Drogo's kin would often enjoy the hospitality of Roramac, Bilbo Baggins. Bilbo, who is related to Frodo on both his father's and mother's sides, shared the same birthday with his young cousin. Bilbo would come to adopt Frodo as his heir in 2989, and Frodo would move from Brandy Hall to Bag End in Hobbiton. Bilbo, who Frodo would call his uncle, taught the latter how to read and even taught him some of the Elvish language. As other hobbits would also experience, Frodo would hear stories of Bilbo's adventures, though Frodo is the only person allowed to read Bilbo's memoirs. Bilbo and Frodo would celebrate 12 birthdays together in Bag End. Over the years, they were known to take long walks in the Water Valley while talking about adventures. Only later would Frodo discover that traveling groups of elves, like those with Gildor, had seen Bilbo and Frodo many times over the years. In his later years, as he would take a long walk, Bilbo would often tell his nephew, it is a dangerous business, Frodo, going out of your door. You step into the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there is no knowing where you might be swept off to. Do you realize that this is the very path that goes through Mirkwood? And that if you let it, it might take you to the Lonely Mountain, or even further into worse places? Finally, in 3001 of the Third Age, Bilbo would celebrate his 111th birthday, as Frodo celebrates his 33rd, the coming of age for young hobbits. Bilbo would of course enact his plan to leave the Shire. Frodo, who was in on the secret of the dramatic disappearance, is left with Bag End and the majority of Bilbo's possessions, including his magic ring. Before leaving the Shire, the wizard Gandalf would warn Frodo not to use the ring. His growing suspicions about the true nature of the ring lead him to investigate in far-off lands, after warning Frodo to keep it secret and safe. Over the next 17 years, Frodo would live in Bag End, honoring Bilbo both on their shared birthday and in his tendency to take long walks from his home. Also, like his uncle, Frodo would seem to remain youthful despite nearing 50 years old. On April 12, 3018, Gandalf returns to Hobbiton, telling Frodo the following day of the history of the One Ring and that Bilbo's ring is the One. Frodo agrees to take the ring to Rivendell and buys a house in Crick Hollow to disguise his journey east. The wizard would remain with Frodo in Bag End for two months before leaving to discover what he could about the wider world. As summer turns to autumn, Gandalf does not return and Frodo finally sets out to Crick Hollow on September 23rd, 3018, the day after his 50th birthday, without hearing from the wizard. Mary and Fatty Bulger take the cart of Frodo's possessions ahead, and Frodo leaves the keys and the dirty dishes 
for the Sackville Bagginses, who had long coveted Bag End for themselves. Pippin, Sam, and Frodo head on the road to Crick Hollow, and twice are overtaken by a black horseman. The first instance they hide off the road. The second, the rider is driven off by the singing of elves traveling nearby. The hobbits camp with the elves above Woodhall. Their leader, Gildor, talks with Frodo about his journey to Rivendell. He will not tell much about the mysterious black riders, save only that they are servants of the enemy and to flee them when they should meet in the future. The following day, they would stay off the road, attempting to avoid the riders. They finally arrive at Bamferlong, the farm of Farmer Maggot, on the afternoon of September 25, 3018. From Maggot, they learned that a black rider had come to his house asking for baggins. Maggot would give Frodo and his companions a ride in his wagon to Buckleberry Ferry, where they meet Mary. Maggot gives Frodo a package courtesy of his wife, revealed to be a basket of mushrooms, recalling Frodo's fondness for stealing the vegetable during his youth. As they are ferried across the river into Buckland, they spot an ominous dark shape on the dock they had just left. Frodo arrives at Crick Hollow that evening, where the other four hobbits reveal they are aware of Frodo's plan to leave the Shire altogether. In fact, they've already resolved to go with him, while Fatty Bulger will remain behind to keep up appearances that Frodo is living in Crick Hollow. The following day, Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin enter the Old Forest, leaving the lands of the Shire behind. After becoming trapped by Old Man Willow, they are saved by Tom Bombadil. They come to Bombadil's home, where they meet his wife, Goldberry. The following day, Bombadil tries on the One Ring, which does not make him disappear. Frodo is dismayed and later puts on the ring himself and is further perplexed to find that Bombadil can see him while he is invisible to others. On September 28th, the hobbits bid farewell to Tom and Goldberry, making their way to the Barrow Downs. Lost in the mist of this dark area, they are captured once again, this time by the Barrow Whites. Frodo wakes in a barrow with a Barrow White lurking near his friends. He grabs a nearby sword and strikes the white's hand. Singing the song taught to him by Bombadil, he summons Tom who drives the whites away and wakes his friends. Safe from the mysterious dark creatures, the hobbits take Bombadil's advice and make for the prancing pony in Bree. There, Frodo gives the name Underhill to the landlord, Barlaman Butterbur, and meets a ranger named Strider who warns him not to let his friends tell other patrons of the inn more than they should. As Pippin is telling a crowd about Bilbo's birthday party, Frodo attempts to intervene by singing The Man in the Moon Stayed Up Too Late. While this was not in Peter Jackson's version of The Fellowship of the Ring, we do get a portion of this song performed by James Nesbitt's Beaufort in The Hobbit. Unfortunately, Frodo falls from the table on which he was standing and the ring slips on his finger causing him to vanish and creating a scene far more memorable than Pippin's story. Later, in the Hobbit's room, Strider reveals himself to be a friend of Gandalf, and Butterbur, who had finally remembered a letter Gandalf had left for a Mr. Underhill, delivers the note to Frodo, which backs Strider's claim. Frodo accepts Strider's offer of aid in reaching Rivendell. They head east from Bree, passing through Chetwood, the Midgewater Marshes, and the Weather Hills, arriving at Weathertop on October 6, 3018. There they find Gandalf's mark, indicating he had been there three days earlier, which we later discover resulted in a battle with the Nazgul. Five of the Ringwraiths would attack Frodo and his company upon Weathertop. In desperation, Frodo puts the ring on his finger, revealing to him the Nazgul in their true forms, in the world of the unseen. Despite invoking the name of Elbareth, that is Varda, the queen of the Valar, Frodo is stabbed in the shoulder by the Witch King with a Morgul knife. While Strider would drive the wraiths away, they believe their goal would be accomplished. For Frodo, if left untreated, would slowly be transformed into a wraith himself. Aragorn and the hobbits continue on the journey, hoping to get Frodo to Rivendell before the worst should happen. For 12 days, they travel from Weathertop before they are discovered by Glorfindel, 
who had been sent by Elrond after hearing about Frodo from Gildor. Glorfindel, who has a strong presence in the Unseen World himself, sees that Frodo has begun to fade. He places Frodo upon his horse, Asphaloth, and when the Ringwraiths make a reappearance, the elf orders Frodo to make haste for the ford of Bruinen. Suddenly, the foremost rider spurred his horse forward. It checked at the water and reared up. With a great effort, Frodo sat upright and brandished his sword. Go back, he cried. Go back to the land of Mordor and follow me no more. His voice sounded thin and shrill in his own ears. The riders halted, but Frodo had not the power of Bombadil. His enemies laughed at him with a harsh and chilling laughter. Come back! Come back! They called. To Mordor we will take you. Go back, he whispered. The ring! The ring! They cried with deadly voices. And immediately their leader urged his horse forward into the water, followed closely by two others. By Elbereth and Luthien the Fair, said Frodo with a last effort, lifting up his sword. You shall have neither the ring nor me. The riders are placed within the Bruinen. Between Frodo on one side and Strider, Glorfindel, and the hobbits with torches on the other. By the magic of Elrond and Gandalf, the Bruinen takes the form of great horses, washing away the ring wraiths. Looking to the other side, Frodo sees Glorfindel in his bright, unseen form, for Frodo's fading was worsening. Frodo would awaken days later in Rivendell, mostly healed of his wound by Elrond, who had removed the piece of knife from his shoulder. Frodo is relieved to find Gandalf had arrived in Rivendell ahead of him, and after a feast to celebrate his own recovery, Frodo would get another surprise reunion. Elrond takes his guests to the Hall of Fire, where they find a small sleeping figure. For the first time in 17 years, Frodo sees his uncle Bilbo. The following day at the Council of Elrond, it is determined that their best and only hope is to destroy the One Ring in the fires of Mount Doom. Frodo volunteers to be the ring bearer, and a fellowship is assembled to accompany him on his quest. Gandalf, Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, Boromir, and Sam volunteer to protect the ring bearer, with Merry and Pippin joining later, rounding out the group of nine to stand against the nine ring wraiths. Bilbo gives Frodo his mithril shirt and his sword Sting to help him on the perilous road ahead. Finally, after two months in Rivendell, Frodo sets out with the Fellowship on December 25th, 3018. They journey south along the western side of the Misty Mountains, opting to cross at the Redhorn Pass, which would lead them close to Lorien. However, they must turn back after encountering a great blizzard. Then, in the early hours of January 13th, they are attacked by wolves. Gandalf finally succeeds in convincing the company to pass through the abandoned dwarf kingdom of Khazad-dûm, and they arrive at the doors of Durin that very night. Before passing through the doors, the company, and specifically Frodo, is attacked by the Watcher in the Water, possibly drawn by the power of the Ring. As the Fellowship makes their way through Moria, Frodo realizes they are being followed, which would turn out to be none other than the creature Gollum. The company makes its way through the mines and halls of Moria to the chamber of Mazarbul, the resting place of Balin. There they are attacked by orcs, and once again we see that evil is drawn to Frodo. A great orc lunges at Frodo and stabs him with a spear. Fortunately, what would have been a killing blow is not, thanks to the mithril coat. As the company attempts to escape, they are confronted by the Balrog. After Gandalf's sacrifice, Aragorn leads Frodo and the remainder of the Fellowship to the Nimrodel. Two days later, they arrive at Karas Galathon, where they meet Celeborn and Galadriel. Frodo and the company would remain in Lothlorien for nearly two weeks. On the eve of their departure, Galadriel would follow Frodo and Sam to glance in her mirror. The ring bearer sees many things in this moment. First, a figure clothed in white with a white staff. While Frodo believes it to be a vision of Gandalf's past, or of Saruman, it is actually a resurrected Gandalf the White. 
Next, he sees a glimpse of Bilbo walking restlessly about his room in Rivendell. Then flashes of the great history in which he had become involved. Then he saw the sea and darkness fell. Then a tall ship with torn sails riding up out of the west. He sees the city of Minas Tirith, and though he doesn't know it, a vision of Aragorn's commandeered Corsair fleet. Then the mirror goes dark, and from the black abyss comes the great eye, rimmed with fire. It was glazed, yellow as a cat's, watchful and intent. And the black slit of its pupil opened on a pit, a window into nothing. As the ring grows heavy and Frodo is dragged toward the mirror, Galadriel reminds him to not touch the water. Despite offering Galadriel the ring, Frodo would continue on his quest when the Fellowship leaves the following day. When giving out her gifts, she gives to Frodo a file containing the light of the Silmaril of Earendil. The company travels down the Anduin River, and along the way, Frodo's suspicion that they had been followed by Gollum is confirmed. After the group arrives at Amon Hen, Frodo manages to escape an attempt by Boromir to steal the ring, at which time Frodo resolves to continue his journey alone. However, Sam would discover Frodo as he attempts to cross the Nen Hithoel, insisting on accompanying him. Together, the hobbits would venture into the Emin Muil, where they finally come face to face with Gollum. After the wretched creature is captured, he offers to swear loyalty to Frodo on the ring. Frodo drew himself up, and again Sam was startled by his words and his stern voice. On the precious, how dare you, he said. Think, one ring to rule them all and in the darkness bind them. Would you commit your promise to that, Smeagol? It will hold you, but it is more treacherous than you are. It may twist your words. Beware, Gollum cowered. On the precious, on the precious, he repeated. And what would you swear? asked Frodo. To be very, very good, said Gollum. Then crawling to Frodo's feet, he groveled before him, whispering hoarsely. A shudder ran over him, as if the words shook his very bones with fear. Smeagol will swear never, never to let him have it. Never. Smeagol will save it, but he must swear on the precious. No, not on it said Frodo, looking down at him with stern pity. All you wish is to see it and touch it if you can, though you know it would drive you mad. Not on it, swear by it if you will, for you know where it is. Yes, you know, Smeagol, it is before you. For a moment it appeared to Sam that his master had grown and Gollum had shrunk. A tall, stern shadow, a mighty lord who hid his brightness in gray cloud, and at his feet, a little whining dog. Yet the two were in some way akin and not alien. They could reach one another's minds. Gollum leads the hobbits out of the Emin Muil and through the dead marshes. On March 5th, 3019, they arrive at the Moranin. Seeing the Tower of the Teeth and the Black Gate, Gollum convinces the Ringbearer to follow him to a safer entrance. Two days later, they are in Ithilien near Heneth Anun where Frodo and Sam are questioned and captured by the rangers of Ithilien, under the command of Faramir, brother of Boromir. Blindfolded, they are led to the secret outpost of Heneth Anun itself. When Sam accidentally reveals that Frodo carries Isildur's bane, Faramir denies its temptation. And after the men capture and question Gollum, Faramir releases all three that they may continue on their errand. In doing so, he warns Frodo of the peril of the pass of Cirith Ungol. On March 10, 3019, also known as the Dawnless Day, Frodo, Sam, and Gollum come to the crossroads, where they see the fallen statue of the king. They go on to the gate of Minas Morgul, where they see the host of the Witch King depart, making their way to their great siege of Minas Tirith. That very night, they climb the Great Straight Stair, and come to the top of the winding stair at dawn on March 11th. Gollum leads the hobbits to Shelob's lair, where they are betrayed. Frodo is stung in the neck by the great spider Shelob. Fortunately, the unconscious hobbit is saved by Sam, who drives the spider away. 
Thinking his master dead, Sam takes Sting in the ring, believing he would now have to carry on the quest alone. However, when orcs come to the scene, they capture Frodo and reveal that he is in fact alive. They take him to the tower of Kirith Ungol, where he would be stripped of his belongings and questioned by the orcs. Sam would rescue his master by daring the evil tower. Reunited once more, the hobbits resume their dreadful trek toward Mount Doom, jumping into the ravine west of the Morgai on March 15th. The following day, they would attempt to climb the Morgai, but must instead double back and make for the north end of the valley. On March 18th, they travel the road toward the Eisenmouth, but are overtaken by a company of orcs. In their orc disguises, they are made to march with the company before their eventual escape. The hobbits would continue their journey for nearly a week longer, finally coming to the feet of Mount Doom on March 24th. The following day, they ascend the mountain. After a failed attack by Gollum, Frodo rushes ahead to the Samoth Naur. After sparing Gollum's life, Sam would catch up, finding his master standing at the threshold. The light sprang up again, and there on the brink of the chasm, at the very crack of doom, stood Frodo, black against the glare, tense, erect, but still as if he had been turned to stone. Master, cried Sam. Then Frodo stirred and spoke with a clear voice, indeed with a voice clearer and more powerful than Sam had ever heard him use and it rose above the throb and turmoil of Mount Doom, ringing in the roof and walls. I have come, he said, but I do not choose now to do what I came to do. I will not do this deed, the ring is mine. And suddenly, as he set it on his finger, he vanished from Sam's sight. However, Frodo's pity for Gollum would come to rule the fate of the world. For when Gollum bites off Frodo's finger and reclaims his precious, he slips in his celebration, falling to the depths below, destroying himself and the ring. Frodo and Sam exit the mountain and would be rescued by Gandalf upon Gwaihir, along with the great eagles Landreval and Meneldor. They are taken to Ithilien, where they would awaken weeks later. On April 8th, they are honored at the field of Cormalin. Frodo returns along with the victorious men of the West to Minas Tirith. Over the coming months, Frodo would bear witness to many significant events. At the coronation of King Elisar on May 1st, Frodo would bring the crown of Gondor to Gandalf to place upon Aragorn's head. On Midsummer's Day, Frodo would be present at the wedding of Aragorn and Arwen. Two weeks later, Arwen would officially renounce her immortality giving Frodo her place to sail into the west. In addition, she gives Frodo a white gem on a silver necklace, saying it would aid him when the fear and darkness of the ring come to his mind. Frodo and his friends would depart Minas Tirith on July 22nd, attending the funeral of King Theoden on August 10th. After staying four more days, they would journey north, stopping at Helm's Deep on August 18th before coming to Isengard on August 22nd. There they would learn of Saruman and Wormtongue leaving Orthanc by leave of Treebeard. And here would be the final separation of the Fellowship. Aragorn returns to Gondor, Gimli and Legolas make for Fangorn Forest, and Frodo and the Hobbits go with Gandalf, heading north toward Rivendell. On the way, they overtake Saruman and Grima on the road on August 28th and they continue on to Rivendell, arriving on September 21st. After two weeks in Rivendell, they head west on October 5th and come to the village of Bree on October 28th. There they learn from Barlam and Butterbur of ill fortunes that have befallen the area. Sam is also reunited with Bill the Pony, who had returned safely to Bree after being set loose at Moria. On October 30th, Gandalf and the Hobbits come to the Brandywine Bridge. Gandalf leaves to visit Tom Bombadil, sending the hobbits forth to deal what should await them at home. The following day, Frodo and the hobbits come to Frog Morton, where the Shire sheriffs attempt to place them under arrest. It turns out that the Shire itself had been overthrown, now ruled by a tyrant named Sharky. The following day, they would arrive at Bywater, where the four heroes lead their fellow hobbits in defeating the ruffians. Coming to Bag End, it is revealed that Sharky is in fact Saruman, 
Frodo says they should spare Saruman's life, but Saruman tries to kill Frodo with a hidden knife. However, it is turned away by the mithril coat. Still, Frodo's remarkable mercy is once again on display. Do not kill him even now, for he has not hurt me, and in any case, I do not wish him to be slain in this evil mood. He was great once, of a noble kind that we should not dare to raise our hands against. He is fallen, and his cure is beyond us, but I would still spare him, in the hope that he may find it. However, Saruman's abuse of Grima would come to bear, as Wormtongue slits Saruman's throat before being struck down by hobbit archers himself. Their deaths mark the end of the War of the Ring. For the next two years, the Hobbit heroes would help with the restoration and reordering of the Shire, with Frodo temporarily serving as the mayor of Mickle Delving. Yet Frodo would still be plagued by his wounds. Every March 13th and October 6th, he would fall ill. The anniversaries of Shelob's sting and the Witch King's stab, respectively. Frodo could be found clutching the white gem on these dates, much in the same manner as his holding of the One Ring. Finally, on September 21st, 3021, Frodo sets out for the Grey Havens, ready to take the place given to him by Arwen on the White Ship. They arrive at the Havens on September 29th. Frodo, who had no heir of his own, leaves Bag End, the Red Book, and his possessions to Sam. After bidding farewell to his friends, Frodo joins Bilbo and the Keepers of the Elven Rings as they take the straight road into the west. And the ship went out into the high sea and passed on into the west, until at last on a night of rain, Frodo smelled a sweet fragrance on the air and heard the sound of singing that came over the water. And then it seemed to him that as in his dream in the house of Bombadil, the gray rain curtain turned all to silver glass and was rolled back. And he beheld white shores and beyond them a far green country under a swift sunrise. Frodo would spend the rest of his mortal days on the Isle of Tol Erasea, in a period of reflection and peace, giving him the chance to truly understand his position in Arda before his eventual death, passing beyond the circles of the world and the fate that awaits all mortals of Middle-earth. Unlike Frodo, I find myself never wanting to leave Middle-earth and hanging some great pieces of art by Jerry Vanderstelt helped my nerd cave feel a bit more like Middle Earth itself. Jerry has some of the greatest and most realistic prints you'll find. What I love is that Jerry doesn't just replicate the film characters with incredible detail, but he also illustrates moments we don't see exactly in the films, giving us something incredibly familiar, but also fresh and unique. And right now you can save 20% off your order with the code VS20. Use the code now through December 9th to save on great artwork at VanderSteltStudio.com. As always, I wanna say a huge thank you to all my Patreon and YouTube supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Lissamy the Cinda, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, CCDC Red Team, Joe Tepper, The Mighty Mim, Andrew Carlisle, Leo Vittori, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Berto Berg, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Michael Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description to purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.